going to talk to us tonight for a little while on the topic of how much do you want it? Amen. How much do you want it? John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. The King James text reads, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Master, we thank you, God, tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, powerful presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place tonight. God, we need the anointing from heaven if we're going to be effective in delivering the word of the Lord. For the word of God promises that you send your word as a means of bringing healing and deliverance and salvation. You sent your word and healed them, the word of the Lord declares. Master, right now we just release the word of God in this place, that it might accomplish that for which you would send it forth. Allow the preacher to be anointed. Allow the hearer to be anointed. Allow those in this room and those that will later hear this message by reason of the internet. Allow every ear to be unstopped and every heart to be open to hearing the message that the Holy Ghost from heaven would desire to deliver to their spirit today. Grant it at this very moment, we pray, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. How much do you want it? Jesus came to the man who was on the porch, one of the five porches at the pool of Bethesda, and he asked the man a question. Wilt thou be made whole? I'll tell you tonight, folks, there are a lot of people that Jesus is standing beside tonight asking the question, do you want it? Do you need it? How badly do you want it? Hallelujah. Do you want it? I'm not asking you tonight if you're capable of doing it. I'm not asking you tonight if you've got the ability to accomplish or achieve it. What I'm asking you is, do you want it? Hallelujah to God. Jesus didn't ask this man, are you able to get into the pool to be healed? No. He said, do you want to be healed? Hallelujah to God. He said, will thou be made whole? Just answer me this. Do you want to be healed? That's all I want to know. Amen. It's amazing how we can answer God all kind of every which way, but the way he asked us the question. <laughs> the Lord will ask us a question, and we'll give him some kind of ding-bad answer that doesn't even come close to the question he asked. Lord, I have no man. Isn't that a problem for a lot of us? <laughs> well, I had to throw it out there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, <laughs> it, was just, it was just available to me. I had to take it. Lord, I have no man to take me. Every time, you know, the, the water is troubled. Every time the conditions are right, I'm not in a place to be able to be the first into the pool. 
And I, you know, sometimes I think, Lord, you're so much more patient and so much sweeter than I am. Because I'll tell you, if that had been me, I'd have looked at that poor fellow and said, buddy, I didn't ask you that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> See, Jesus is just so sweet. He didn't, you know, I'd have just looked at him, excuse me, I didn't ask you all that. I didn't ask you to hear your life story. I don't want to know all about your situation. Did I ask you, do you have any help? Because that's a question you answered me. Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. See, there's a lot of people in our community. You can talk to them and say, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be a child of God? Do you want to live for the Lord? And what will they come back and ask? Instead of answering you and saying, yes, I want to be saved. Yes, I want to be a child of God. Yes, I want to live for the Lord. They'll come back and say, well, but the church I belong to teaches. Hello now. Well, the pastor I grew up under says, well, you know, the Assemblies of God tells me, I didn't ask that question. That's not the question I asked. I asked you, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be a child of God? Do you want to live for Jesus? That's all I'm asking. Don't give me all this peripheral junk. <laughs> Hallelujah. You hear me tonight? You see, the problem is we forget when we're talking to the guy who's asking the question. He's the one who wrote the book, honey. He's the one who makes the rules. If he's asking you, that means he can provide it. Hallelujah to God. And tonight, there are people in our community that are hearing from the Holy Ghost from heaven. And God is speaking to them and saying, do you want to be saved? Do you want to live for me? Do you want to be a child of God? Don't tell me what First Baptist says. Don't tell me what the Assemblies of God teaches. Don't tell me what the Church of God says. I'm asking you because I'm the one who makes the rules. Yes. Whoa, hallelujah. That's right. My Bible says, <laughs> I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That's what God says. So you can't put God in a box. You put God in a box, and I got news for you. You've got an explosion about to happen. Because God don't stay in boxes. Hello now. He'll break out of that box faster than you can say boo. See, God is not into living in your box. Amen. When I was a kid, we used to catch fireflies. You remember doing that when you were a kid? Running around catching fireflies in an old mayonnaise jar, you know, and you poke holes in the top. God don't much care to live in your mayonnaise jar. God don't care to live in your box. I'm going to tell you, he'll break out of that thing faster than you can say amen. Oh, let me tell you a story about a man who had God in a box. There was this fella by the name of Peter. And Peter was a devout Jewish gentleman who had walked with and served the Lord for three and a half years as a disciple. He was witness to the Lord's resurrection. He was an eyewitness, first-hand eyewitness to the fact that Jesus Christ was alive again. And Peter was... After the ascension, after Pentecost, Peter was on a rooftop praying one day. And the Word of God said he fell into a bit of a trance. Oh boy, you say that in a lot of churches nowadays, they look at you like you're nuts. What in the world is a trance? Oh God, now you're talking transcendental meditation. Now you're getting up into some crazy... No, that's where you're so focused on God that everything else you lose sight of. Amen. God give us folk know how to fall into a trance once in a while. God give us people know how to get so focused on Jesus that they ain't worried about whether it's dinner time. They're not worried about whether it's lunch time. They're not worried about where they are or how long they've been there. And they're not looking at the clock all through the church service trying to see how long it's been. And trying to estimate how much longer it'll be. Hello now. Amen. The Word of God said time basically just flew by and Peter had been on that rooftop for a long time and he didn't even realize how much time had passed and when he finally began to draw his focus away from prayer and meditation 
all of a sudden he realized, you know what, I've been here a long time, I'm kind of hungry. And at that very moment, the word of God said, a vision appeared before Peter. And in that vision, a sheet came down from heaven. And it opened up. And on that sheet was all kinds of animals. Every one of them, according, listen to me, children. Every one of them, according to the Old Testament law, was unclean and unholy. Listen to me, children. And an abomination for a Jew to eat. Did you hear that? Uh -huh. For those of us that folk come tearing at us, screaming abomination, abomination, abomination all the time. Every one of them animals, Jack, was an abomination for a Jew to eat. And then the voice of the Lord spoke Sally and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And you know what Peter answered? The way any good Christian would answer God when he tells you to do something. No way, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, I tell them the truth. Amen. That's how all us good holiness Pentecostal people are going to answer. God, no way. I don't care what you say. I wouldn't dare do what you tell me to do. And the Spirit of the Lord said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter answered, Lord, no, I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I've never in my life eaten anything unclean or unholy. And then the voice of the Lord responded to Peter and said, Peter, that which I have called holy, don't you dare call it unclean. Don't you dare call it profane. Don't you dare call it unholy. Don't you dare call it unclean. Don't you dare talk down that which I have declared to be okay. But wait a minute. Wasn't it God's law? that said that the goat and the lobster and the shellfish and the scavenger birds and the scavenger fish, wasn't it God's law that said these things were unholy and an abomination to eat? Yeah, but you know what? God reserves the right and has every power in all of heaven and earth to change his mind anytime he wants to. Hello now. See, we lose sight of the fact in the church world today, I don't know very many preachers that are, that are honestly, keenly aware of this one reality. The Old Testament law is fulfilled. It is finished. It is done. It is over. It is completed. Honey, that contract, every condition of that contract has been met. It's done. And yet, you can go into church after church after church today, and they'll be preaching from the Old Testament law. They'll be quoting Deuteronomy. Hello now, they'll be quoting Leviticus. They'll be quoting the Old Testament law. Am I telling the truth, children? I know I am. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Because in one breath they say I get it, and in the next breath they don't get nothing. They don't get it at all. You see, Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross and rise again and give us the gift of the Holy Ghost so that we could be superhuman, so we could be supernatural, so we could go against nature and go against uh, uh, the very essence of our being and be something that we aren't. No, that's not why he went to the cross and died and rose again. That's not why he gave the Holy Ghost. You know why he did those things? Because we can't do those things. But so that grace could find its way into our heart and it could spring forth to life and help us to grab hold of the promise that God said, if you can believe it and hold on to that till you die or until Jesus comes one, then I've got a place for you up here. Hallelujah. Because, see, if you try to do it according to the law, the Word of God said what the law could not do in that it was weak in the flesh. The law couldn't do it. It was impossible. He said God condemns sin in the flesh. He literally, God Himself, condemns sin in the flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And now we are able to have a hope. We are able to have an assurance. We are able to have a peace in our spirit that all is well with God. Not based on what we are, who we are, what we can be, what we can do, what we can't do. No, no, no. But based on His righteousness. Hallelujah. Because the Bible teaches me all my righteousness before the Lord is as filthy rags. See, my righteousness, Joni, I don't care how right I get it, it still ain't pretty in God's eyes. No matter how clean I think I get myself, I can never be clean enough. Amen. No matter how pure I think I've got myself, I can never be pure enough. The only hope I have is through faith in His name. Hallelujah. That's, right. That's the only hope I have. You know why we're in church tonight? Because we're trusting Jesus. You know why we're here tonight? Because we're trusting the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know Amen. why we're here tonight? Because our faith and confidence is in Him, not in us. Amen. That's our message. That's what we believe. It's that simple. It's not a hard thing to get. Amen. I'm a child of God not because I'm good, not because I'm perfect, not because I can do it right. I'm a child of God because God said I'm His child. And he said, if I can believe this thing, if I can trust him and take him at his word and believe what he said is so, he said, then honey, you'll be part of my family. Mm -hmm. And I got news for you. I don't care if you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. If you can believe this thing, if you can accept this thing, if you can obey this message and live for the Lord the best you can, the best you know how. Amen. Because I got news for you. You're going to live for the Lord. Hello now. Oh, I hear the crickets chirping. <laughs> Amen. A lot of affirming churches want to get out there and act like, you know, you do, all you got to do is believe this thing, then you can just act like a dog. No, 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 no. Because see, there's an old saying. I, I've tried to explain this to people before, this little example. If somebody comes in the room, Sally, and they're screaming, the building's on fire, the building's on fire. And you look at them and say, okay, I believe you. But you keep your rear end right in that seat. Do you really believe me? Mm -mm. You don't believe me very much. But if somebody comes in the building and screams, the building's on fire, the building's on fire. If you really believe what he's saying, you're going to get up and you're going to get out of this building. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I've got news for you. When you become a child of God, when you become born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit, according to Acts 2.38, I'm going to tell you what happens. You're going to believe God. You're going to believe what the Lord says. And you're going to believe that one day we're all going to stand before God and answer for the deeds that are done in the flesh. Hello now. You're going to believe what Jesus said when he said that one day he's going to come back and he'll reward every man according to his works. You're going to believe that. And if you believe that, Josh, you're going to live like you believe it. Yeah. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's that simple. So there's no such thing as a child of God and a Christian who lives like a dog, and lives like a fool, and doesn't try to make some effort and every effort possible to live a good, godly, moral, decent life. Am I telling the truth? Amen. No such thing. You can't do it. Because if you're living that way, what you're doing is you're living as an unbeliever. You're living like somebody that don't believe what God has said. But if you're genuinely a believer and you're a born-again child of God, then you're going to live like a believer. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's that simple. It's not a hard thing to understand. And not only that, but when you're a child of God, when you've been adopted by the Father and you've come into that family, after which all the family of heaven and earth is named. When you come into that place, you want everybody to be part of that family. That's right. I'll tell you, I wished everybody could be part of this family. And I want to do everything in my power, Joni. I don't always do a good job. Matter of fact, probably I do a worse job of it nowadays than I ever did. But I want to do everything in my power to live my life in such a way that others who've been where I have been who are where I have been, can look my way and say, you know what, look where he's at today. Look at what joining that family did for him. Look at what becoming a child of God did for him. You know what, maybe that's what I ought to do. 
maybe that's the choice I ought to make. Maybe that's the direction I ought to go in. See, a lot of Christian people live their lives, and we don't ever think about our testimony. We don't ever think about our witness. We don't think about how others perceive God through us. Yet Paul the Apostle said, we are living epistles, read of men. All men, honey, not everybody reads the Bible. But every single person on this planet sees one. Hello now. They may not ever open the book, Josh, but they see you walking around. And you may be the only Bible they read. Hello, That's man. Right. That's right. And a lot of us live our lives and we don't ever think about how did that choice, how did that decision, how did that action, how did those words affect my testimony? How did that affect my uh, witness? in front of an unbelieving world. Did I make somebody want to know the Lord by acting this way, by doing this, by living like this? Or did I make them think, well, you know what? He ain't no different than I am. He ain't no better than I am. Why, why in the world should I do what he... Why should I go to church? Why in the world should I pray? Why in the world should I read my Bible? He's the same as I am. What difference does it make? Hello now. Mm -hmm. Amen. I want to tell you tonight, folks, Jesus came to that man at the porch of the pool of Bethesda and said, Wilt thou be made whole? How bad do you want this thing? Because it's available to you. It may not be available to you, listen to me now, the way it's always been done. It may not be available, you may not be able to believe this thing like you was raised to believe it. You may not be able to approach this thing the way you were raised to approach it. I had to go through a period of transformation in my life where God helped me to understand grace better. Amen. I had to go through a period of life. Because see, growing up as a kid in the assemblies of God, I was convinced that anybody could be saved who believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody could be. Except that the minute they were converted, all of a sudden now, Joni, they had 100,000 rules they had to live up to to be saved. Am I telling the truth? See, we preach a very conflicted message. We, can, we preach a lot of conflict and a lot of uh, disagreement, folks. We stand there and tell people, hey, no matter who you are, glory to God. You know, the preacher's brother, remember the old days, they get out there and get their altar call and glory to God. They weep and cry. And it don't matter where you're coming from. <laughs> it don't matter who you are. It don't matter. Oh, God loves you. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. Glory to God. All you got to do is come down to this altar and pray this prayer after me. And then the minute you've done that, all of a sudden you got 60 or 80 or 100 or 1,000 eyes in the church looking at you. Well, he's still smoking. Well, do you see that? She had a drink. Do you see the length of that dress? My goodness, it don't even come near her knee. Well, I, I think she dyes her hair. Did you see that? Well, I'll tell you what. If them earrings are any bigger, you could just make you a great big old chandelier out of them, you know. And all of a sudden, do you understand what I'm saying? All of a sudden, there's this whole set of rules and regulations and legalisms and laws that, oh, According to the same preacher who last night preached, all you got to do is believe and accept, and you'll be saved. And tonight he's preaching that every one of these things will kick you out of heaven. Hello now, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> that lipstick on your lips will keep you out of heaven. That dye in your hair will keep you out of heaven. That pants ladies will keep you out of heaven. Those dresses men will keep you out of heaven. <laughs> I got to tell you, last night, we went to a show over here. <laughs> Sally was gracious, enjoyed the whole thing, and we were bored to death. Joni and me and Tommy were just making jokes amongst ourselves. We were having a blast. And poor Sally kept looking at us, shaking her head like, y'all are just bad. Y'all are just mean, you know. <laughs> Then all of a sudden they're doing karaoke and this one character comes up. 
I don't even know how to describe this exactly. Let's just say it was a hot mess, okay? That's about the best way I can say it. And all of a sudden, Sally, who's been just gracious and wonderful the whole night through, says, Oh dear God! <laughs> and she said, I'm sorry, Tony, but that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I about split a gut. I thought I was going to lose it. I just said, all night long, she was perfectly fine. You know, all these drag queens performing and all this going on. And she was fine with all of it until this one particular character came up there. And, you know, there are some legs that were never meant to be seen, okay? <laughs> There are some midriffs <laughs> that should be covered all the way down to the middle of the knee with a nice long garment, okay? And, you know, not when you got a big old pot belly like I do, and then you're going to win a, a wear a cut-off t-shirt, you know, have your belly sticking out for the world to see. Anyway, uh, my point being this tonight, <laughs> we had a good time. We enjoyed ourselves anyway. But I want to tell you folks, I want, I want you to understand tonight, and I want people in our community who are watching this on the internet, I want them to get this. I want you to understand this tonight. You cannot put God in a box. You can't do it. He's promised that if you will believe and obey. i got news for you. Anybody tells you you can be saved by simply believing, they're telling you a fib. They're telling you a lie. That is not from heaven. That is a lie. You cannot be saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of God said, you believe that there is one God, thou doest well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Mm -hmm. I don't mean the demons are saved. Hello now. Right. But they believe in God. They believe Jesus is who Jesus is. Am I telling the truth? Right. They believe he died and rose again. You better believe they do. They were standing there watching it happen. Yeah. But that doesn't make them saved. You can't just believe the gospel. There's the obedience aspect of the gospel. Peter preached at Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Honey, it's not hard. It's a pretty simple thing. It's a pretty easy thing. But you can't just believe it. You've got to act on it. James said in the book of James, faith without works is dead, being alone. You can't just say, I believe this thing. You've got to act on what you claim to believe. And you don't just act on it any old way you want to act on it. You act on it according to God's prescribed plan. Mm -hmm. If God said, stand on your head and yodel and quote John 3.16, then baby, I'll be standing on my head yodel and quoting John 3.16. It's that easy. But he didn't ask me to do that. He asked me to repent. Turn around from unbelief, turn to faith in God, turn around from a life of sin and, and live in a life as though God isn't real. Turn around and face God. Turn around and live for God. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Okay, Lord, if that's all i got to do, take me to the water. <laughs> Amen. If that's all i got to do, then get me there as fast as you can get me there. It's time for me to get wet. Amen. The Lord said to that man at the pool of Bethesda, Will thou be made whole? And that man had an answer for the Lord based on what he thought had to happen for him to be healed. But he didn't understand. The one asking him the question had the ability to heal him. The Lord's asking us tonight, You want to be saved? Joni, I've got news for you. God's asking somebody watching this video, do you want to be saved? The Spirit of the Lord speaking to their heart. Do you want to be saved? Don't give me a bunch of excuses. Don't give me a bunch of explanations. I'm just asking, do you want to be saved? Answer yes or no. Yes, Lord, I do. Okay, we can do that. Hallelujah. We can work that out. Because you're talking to the one that the Word of God says, Paul, the Apostle, wrote and said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know why, Sally, I don't let anybody come against me in my relationship with God? You know why? You better step back, even in your feistiest days. If you think you're going to wrestle with me, whether I can be a child of God or not, honey, you better step... Hmm. 
that you don't want to mess with me. When I was ordained in September of 1990, what was it, 4, 1994, September 18th, 1994, the pastor who ordained me, <laughs> he said, I'll tell you one thing, so you don't ever want to come at this man and come against his relationship with God. You don't ever want to accuse him of not being a child of God and not being a servant of the Most High. He said, he'll rebuke you and set you right down as fast as he can set you. I said, you better believe I will. You better believe I will. So you're not going to stand there and come against my relationship with God. I have bad days like everybody else. Sometimes I'm better at Sally than other days. Sometimes I slip a little and I say things I shouldn't say, do things I shouldn't do. That doesn't make me any less a child of God than I am on my best day. So you don't want to, you don't want to mess with me. It's not a good idea. My Bible teaches me that there's one accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got news for you. You start spewing accusation, you're working for him. Uh -huh. yep. Hello now. That's right. You start shooting accusations out of your lips, and you're not on God's payroll. You're on the other guys. <laughs> Amen. The Word of God tells me, work out your own salvation. You know what? You concentrate on whether or not you're making heaven, and I'll concentrate on whether or not I'm making heaven. And the only obligation I have to you in this pew tonight next to me, the only obligation you have tonight to the person next to you in this church is to encourage them and inspire them and to push them on forward and to help them achieve their goal. Amen. Not to say anything that's going to keep them from getting there. Amen. The only obligation we have, honey, keep pressing on. Brother, you may not be tonight where you need to be, but you're going to get there. Hallelujah to God. In Jesus' name. Because I can stand here and spew all kinds of garbage out of my lips tonight about the evils of this or the evils of that. I can preach all kinds of negativity and all kinds of do's and don'ts. But you know what? That's not my job. My job isn't to scare anybody out of living for Jesus. My job is to help encourage them and help them realize living for God is a wonderful thing. And you can make it. You can make it. It can happen for you. Amen. Will thou be made whole? Yes, Lord. That's what I want. The question tonight is, how much do you want it? Do you want it enough to think out of the outside of the box? Do you want it enough to... Quit trying to accomplish it this way, their way. You know how many people tonight are going to go through Exodus International? They're going to go through this program or that program to try to become something they're not. All because they're trying to please somebody. You're listening to me now. They're trying to do it the way they think it has to be done. And the Lord's saying, uh, excuse me. I asked you, do you want to be made whole? Don't tell me how you got to do it because you don't have to do it that way. You're talking to the guy who wrote the book. Do you hear me now? Do you want to be made whole? And if so, how much do you want it? Because if you want it bad enough, it's yours tonight in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me tonight?